So good morning, everyone. My name is Allison Julian, and I would like to take a moment to welcome all of you to the Justice in the Home Domestic Work Past, Present, and Future Convention. I will briefly share a bit about myself and about my work. I am a proud nanny. I am a third generation domestic worker. For more than 20 years, I have been a nanny providing love and care for approximately 15 children and working for nine families here in New York. I have worked full-time and part-time. Like many workers, I have worked long hours with substandard wages. For many years, I have worked over 50 hours a week without overtime pay after 40 hours of work. Oftentimes, I had to work when I was sick, and sometimes I was not paid for taking sick days. With the exclusion of many labor laws until the passage of the Domestic Worker Bill of Rights here in New York in 2010, many workers made their laws on the park bench, and that was nearly not enough. Some of these challenging working conditions changed for me after the spring of 2002 when I got involved in organizing domestic, for the domestic worker rights and I became more assertive on my job. Through organizing, we realized workers needed a voice beyond the park bench and a face behind, from behind closed doors. I became very instrumental in organizing workers for the passage of the historic Domestic Worker Bill of Rights here in New York, because workers like me were in need of protection in the workplace. Based on the research done on domestic workers in the industry in this country, we have learned a lot. And we have also allowed us the space to shape this workforce and we hope with future research, we will be able to win significant gains for domestic workers all over this country. And workers all over the world as we continue doing the work that makes all other work possible. Today, many immigrant communities across the New York and across the US are organizing workers, empowering them to create space where workers can demand better working conditions and change laws in the domestic worker industry. Over the next two years, we will engage in conversations about domestic work. Workers are also filled with great anticipation to take part in the Labor of Love Convention on Sunday. Workers are excited about the space to build community and to engage in deeper discussions on how we on the ground are fundamental components in shaping the direction of this industry. We invite you to listen actively, to allow your creativity to rise to the surface as we continue to learn from the past, improve the present, and create an empowering, dignified legacy for domestic workers in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Fabulous organizer, great outreach worker. Um, really glad to see you all here this morning. My name's Linda Burnham. I'm one of the organizers uh, of the conference. And I realized when I was going um, home on the, or uh, going downtown on the subway last night, that I was so aware of the time uh, for last night's panel. Um, that I didn't really thank them adequately. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, for the, and for those of you who were not here last night, it was a fabulous panel. Um, so I just wanted to, to kind of note the place of that uh, work for newer researchers or for folks who don't necessarily know the literature. Um, there was a time when folks uh, did not knew that it was a fact that domestic work was women's work, but it was a fact and not a question. <laughs> uh, it was a fact that was not particularly thought about. Uh, there was certainly a time when folks knew that 
uh, some women did the work and some women hired the workers, but that also was not thought about deeply. Uh, there was a time before folks drew the links between the legacies of slavery and particularly in the West and the Southwest, the legacies of conquest and colonialism in uh, the contemporary work. So there was a time before all that was investigated and interrogated and questioned. And uh, the folks on the panel last night uh, are, the, are among the ones who opened that all up for us. And so the work that's going on today, um, the research and the scholarship that's going on today, builds on their legacy. So I don't know if the folks are in the room who were on that panel, uh, Mary Romero and Tara Hunter, Eileen, Boris is there, Evelyn Nakano, uh, Glenn and Elizabeth with Clark Lewis, but if we could just give them a hand for the incredible work that they did. Um, let's see, so I'm gonna ask the panel to start coming up here, and as the panel list are coming up, I wanna say, I mentioned last night that one of the keys of uh, good organizing is to find good partners. Uh, when I was brought on as a researcher at National Domestic Workers Alliance, um, there was a lot of work that had been done, but nearly no empirical work. Come on up. Um, so there was a ton of stuff we just did not know about wages and working conditions across the country. There was not a lot of hard data, and we really needed the hard data in order to do the advocacy work. And so uh, when I was brought on, Nick was already, Nick Theodore was already um, trying to figure out how to make that happen. And over the course of two years, um, I worked with Nick and Saba Wahid, who's here and was with the data center, and Beth Gutierrez, who's also here, was also connected with uh, uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago. They were wonderful partners in uh, doing a research project that spanned the country, was done in nine different languages, and ended up uh, in a report called Home Economics. And uh, Nick was, it was a participatory research project, so uh, domestic workers were involved in every step of the process, including developing the research instrument, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to uh, the data analysis. And uh, I have to say that Nick was uh, the best partner you could ask for in that work. So you'll see his bio um, in the book here, but uh, I really, truly appreciate the effort and the expertise he brought to that project. And he's gonna chair our panel this morning. So, carry on. See, Linda, uh, Linda gets me all choked up and then tells me I have to start talking. The, uh, well, it, I, I wanna add my welcome to all of you. It's great to see so many uh, folks here today with us. And it's great to see so many friends from that research project Linda was talking about, NDWA launched a major research project a couple years ago to document the state of domestic work in this country. And it was a phenomenal effort uh, involving hundreds, literally hundreds of domestic workers and domestic worker organizers, including uh, Lydia Katina Amaya, who you heard from yesterday, who you met yesterday, uh, as she welcomed us to this event. Uh, the report's entitled Home Economics, the Invisible and Unregulated World of, of Domestic Work, and I just want to make sure that you're aware of the study, uh, largely for two reasons. Uh, first, that it was a tremendous effort on the part of NDWA affiliates, members, and domestic workers. Uh, we surveyed over 2,000 uh, nannies, caregivers, and house cleaners across 14 U.S. cities. Uh, as Linda mentioned, the survey was done in nine languages. 
by the time we were finished, we had interviewed workers from 71 different countries. Without the work of domestic workers, I'm quite confident that never, ever would have been possible. The other reason uh, I hope you know about the study is that, uh, to my knowledge, it's the only systematic national assessment of domestic work in this country. Uh, and it was a quite comprehensive study that looked at all facets of domestic work and its impact on, on the workforce. So after the survey was done, uh, I was doing some one-on-one -on -one interviews just to, uh, to add to the report. Uh, and Lydia uh, introduced me um, to a member of Damayan here in New York. Um, in the report, we refer to her as, as Anna. Anna was from the Philippines. Uh, she was working as a domestic worker for a family right here uh, in Midtown Manhattan. The, um, the employer was a CFO of a Fortune 500 firm. Um, and you'll be familiar with part of this story, I think. Um, you know, Anna basically did every household task imaginable. Her day started at 6 in the morning uh, when the children woke up. And over the course of the day, she fed the children and saw them off to school, did the cooking, the cleaning, the ironing, uh, took care of all their needs. Uh, when the children were done with school, she helped them do their homework, uh, taught them to read, and so on. Uh, her work days were long. The, uh, it, her, her day started at 6 in the morning and ended around 10 o'clock at night after she had put the, the children to bed, after she had cleaned the, the kitchen uh, following cooking the family meal. Um, so she was working about 16 hours a day. At the, the time that I met her, uh, she had been working seven days a week for 15 months straight. At night, she slept on the floor between the children's beds. The family had promised to pay her $1,500 a month, but in the end, Anna was only making $620. In other words, she was making $1.27 an hour. The report highlights the cases of, of domestic workers, and I'm, I'm thankful to say that most are not as abusive as those faced by, by Anna. But the report tells of the hardships that domestic workers face arising from their low pay, the economic insecurity that they face, the family hardships that they face because of the conditions within the industry. The report talks about the toll that domestic work takes on the body, partly through the sheer physicality of the work, and partly because so many domestic workers are, are exposed to a range of toxins that build up over time, and the injuries that occur within the industry, which are so widespread. So our, our panel today is going to talk a bit about the context of domestic work and, and the context behind what we have found and what the domestic workers here in this room have known since they've been in the industry, that there are severe hardships in this industry. Our panel is called Evolutions of Household Labor, Domestic Work, and Inequalities of Class, Race, Gender, and Citizenship. We have uh, four speakers, but a bit of a surprise here. Uh, our four speakers, Eva Gattay, Jennifer Klein, Cecilia, Cecilia Rio, uh, are all here. Uh, Peggy Smith, unfortunately, um, has come down with uh, what looks to be food poisoning. Told you don't eat out in New York. No, uh, she's come down with food poisoning. And now, who, I ask you this, who among you at 925, if you were told you've got to join a panel, who really wants to be up here, <laughs> right? Well. There's one brave soul, so my early nominee for the most valuable player of the conference is, is Premla Nadison, uh, who has uh, ably and valiantly uh, presented herself in front of you today to, to join our panel, and uh, we're very thankful about that. Uh, the, the panel uh, uh, description mentions that this is an industry that's structured by axes of social inequality, including race, class, gender, citizenship, age, and ability. Um, but we always have to remember that these axes don't just occur naturally, right? They are the outgrowth of a set of social conventions, sometimes social conventions enshrined into law. They're an outgrowth of a set of employer practices. But they can be contested, and that's what NDWA does. Um, and so that, this won't be the end of the story, but we'd like to turn it over here to our panelists now. Each will give a, a short presentation, very short presentation. I have uh, perhaps a few uh, questions, and then as last night, we're going to throw it open to you. So be ready, be making some notes, because your time will come.
So with that, let's uh, turn it over to the panelists. So we had been given some questions and, um, and then also asked to show an image. So I'm not sure I can pull this off. But first, let me just say thank you to the organizers of the conference and thank you for inviting me to participate in it. I mean, this is such an ideal, you know, for somebody like me who's a historian writing about the past, but to be able to engage with the movement in the present and, and going forward. And also, I'm a Barnard alum, so it's great to be here. And I think it shows how much the work has accomplished, both in terms of the scholarship and the organizing, because I don't think a conference like this would have taken place here when I was here 25 to 30 years ago, if I should admit that. Um, but anyway, so uh, let's see here. So I'm, I was asked to talk about, um, about you know, this kind of institutional structure um, that over time, uh, really created a racialized and gendered occupation and labor market. So I wanted to talk about, first of all, how the state actually created um, what we think of as this occupation. And home care had existed, of course, in this netherworld between public and private, family care and employment. And it's possible because of the devaluation of women's work as well as the stigmatization that's attached to the labors of poor women of color. But this devaluation thesis, um, of course, it assumes that the, um, the unworthiness of the labor because of the race and the class and gender of the workers, but it's not just about that kind of ascribed gender and racial meanings, but also how the state has chosen to structure it. And so to take home care as this example, it emerged as a distinct occupation um, during the crisis of the Great Depression and the New Deal, one strand took shape um, for poor women or who were incapacitated, who couldn't take care of their children. They were in the hospital or they were at home with chronic illness, and the state sent a substitute mother into the home. And basically, they looked at African-American women who were unemployed, who had been domestic workers, and saw them as the ready labor force for these kinds of jobs. So see, and so this legacy of slavery, as some people mentioned yesterday, and segregation hung over the labor, um, defined it as low paid and unskilled, and as fitting work for African American women. Now relieving hospitals, especially public hospitals, of the long term Ill, elderly and chronically ill patients became the other origin of home based care. And the Works Progress Administration, WPA, initiated programs to move these people out of the hospital and give them the necessary assistance to become independent. Now, the important thing to note here is that central to the origin of both of these is in assistance to the poor. Not only the workers, but the clients who obtained eligibility through a Department of Welfare had to be, um, had to be destitute. So the New Deal left a threefold legacy, which persisted for the rest of the century. Although tied to the medical sector, the state would pay for home-based care through welfare agencies. Secondly, welfare and policy experts and welfare administrators saw female public assistance recipients as the ready supply of labor for these jobs and continued to track them into these jobs. And third, the exclusion of home care attendants from the wages and hours laws remained in place for the rest of the century and into the 21st century. So it's important to note, though, it's not just that government plays a role in shaping this, but it's what part of the welfare state it's within. And it's within public assistance or welfare, the most stigmatized part of the welfare state. So advocates for home care never had access to the more generous components of the American welfare state, such as social security or hospital building construction. They only had titles to the lesser, you know, only had access to the lesser titles of social security, those set up for child welfare, adult categorical aid, um, assistance to the disabled. And so it meant they were always piecing together very small amounts of money. So now, multiple arenas, the public hospital, the social welfare agency, 
the market for domestic servants created this political economy um, of welfare and home care. The other thing that happens is, is after World War II, hospitals started to set up their own programs, um, especially public hospitals. And what they did was they talked about the idea of a home care team that would see the patient into the home. And they talked about the doctor and the nurse and the social worker and the housekeeper. They used the term housekeeper, which reflected the non-medical designation of work done in hospitals. But hospitals always assumed this labor was just casual. It was just like the friendly visitor who lived next door who might check in um, on a neighbor. And so that gives it a casualized essence. From these two models, these two tracks of welfare and the medical model, this notion of rehabilitation emerges, which becomes ideologically important. What we found is this dual rehabilitation. The idea that if you could move people who were disabled or chronically ill out of institutions and put them at home, then they would somehow become independent and no longer dependent. And if you looked at women who were on public assistance, poor women, and pushed them into wage work in these jobs, it would somehow rehabilitate them um, and make them not dependent on the state. So the deserving clients of social assistance, the elderly and chronically ill, depended on the undeserving recipients of AFDC. And this happened in cities like Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, and New York. And what was amazing that we found in the research was whether it was the New Deal in the 1930s, welfare in the 1950s, the war in poverty in the 1960s, the CETA program of the 1970s, or workfare in the 1990s, Policymakers never lost their faith that poor women of color would be rehabilitated through new jobs in domestic labor. Now, with the war on poverty, um, the Office of Economic Opportunity in 1964 created programs for AFDC recipients, again, to go into work, into so service occupations, which they saw as the growth labor market. And again, they set up these housekeeper programs, homemaker programs, and home attended programs. And they also had something called new careers, which would allegedly lead people along a track towards promotion. But in fact, um, for, again, women put into these domestic labor jobs in the home, which remained outside of labor standards, the new career ended up looking a lot like the old one. So the reclassification, oh, and then the final point I guess I should make is the impoverishment and marginalization were only further um, reinforced in the mid-1970s when the new amendments to the Fair Labor Standards Act, the wage and hour law, um, that was meant to bring domestic workers into coverage specifically excluded home care aides, especially those who had worked in agencies. Um, and so what happens is, is the reclassification of home care workers in the mid-70s occurred just as the long-term care demand began to explode with senior citizens and a disability rights movement calling for community and home-based alternatives to institutionalization, especially in the face of nursing home scandals. And so, and then when you get Medicare and Medicaid, um, you get the emergence of a new entity that hadn't existed before, the Medicare Certified Agency, which displaces the older nonprofit visiting nurse service. Um, so this is one factor that would make a for-profit long-term care franchise industry grow. And now employers were handed the tool um, to have flexibility to use workers for as many hours as they needed without incurring overtime pay costs. And so they could continue to steal labor from an occupation associated with black and other women of color. And after 1976, the industry entered a significant phase of growth that remains unabated. And finally, changes to Medicare and Medicaid and other government programs after 1980 opened the door to for-profit providers. And so what you then get is this determination that home care would be low-paid, low-cost labor that somehow reassured governments once again that herein lay the answer to several welfare problems overcrowding of public hospitals, rising costs of nursing homes, and an aging population, 
with public refusal to spend dollars on welfare. And then you get the emergence of two dominant forms, the independent provider and um, the vendor agency. And so through these two mechanisms, um, it distances workers from the public employment, the government that actually had done so much to set this occupation during the previous quarter century. And so I think I'll um, end there, but I base, you know, I do want to make the point though that, um, that the state is not always an all powerful static entity. That social movements and worker self organization have produced forms of political agency that in fact reshape the state. Um, and so I think, uh, I think we can take that up in, in, um, in the discussion that will ensue about how we connect you know, the institutional terms and the places of leverage that workers have to reshape the occupation to their advantage. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Cecilia Rio. I'm a political economist. Um, <clears throat> And I want to first thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm not quite sure what I'm doing here because I just am blown away with the caliber of scholars that are here. Um, but I'll do my best to try to bring up the issues that I think are very important. Um, and I, I want to say that I was drawn to domestic work because I'm very much interested as a political economist in social justice and in particular critiques of capitalism. And because of the panel that you had last night, all those scholars, their scholarship that they did, it, it put such interesting questions on the table that I was very much drawn to paid domestic work. I come from the University of Massachusetts where there is a uh, leftist contingent, uh, uh, radical, some of us embrace the term Marxism, some were Marxists but flew away from that term, you know fall the Berlin Wall and all in 1899 when I started. But I embrace the term and I also am very serious about sort of the critique of capitalism. Uh, one of my mentors was Nancy Fulbray, who I'm sure you also know her work was very much instrumental in drawing attention to the issue of domestic work. I wanted to bring in uh, this other issue of race and as I said, the, the work of the uh, panel last night put some really interesting questions on the table. So I'm also uh, mostly an educator, so I live in a world now where image is everything, right, with young people. So I'm gonna do most of the talk through a few images, um, just as a way to focus the conversation. And really, I'm not gonna say too much. I really would prefer to actually answer questions. But I thought I'd start off this issue um, with a quote by Du Bois. Du Bois, who was a Marxist, a genius, and also very prophetic. And in this quote, he highlights the social construction of domestic work and its association with race. Du Bois recognized the social construction of domestic work as a despised and degraded occupation intensified by its increasing association with race at this time. In Philadelphia Negro, Du Bois remarked, so long as the entrance into domestic service involves loss of all social standing and consideration, so long will domestic service be a social problem. The problem will vary in character with different countries and time, but there will always be some maladjustment in the population maladjustment in social relations when any considerable part of the population is required to get its support in a manner which the other part despises or affects to despise. In the United States, the problem is complicated by the fact that for years, domestic service was performed by slaves and afterward, up to today, largely black freedmen and thus adding a despised race to a despised calling. Thus, by long experience, the uh, United States has come to associate domestic service with some inferiority uh, in race or training. So this slide, I think, really highlights this issue of domestic work, its association with race and gender, and also in the social construction of what we even think domestic work is. You know, so you see cl quite clearly here, I think, race, class, gender, and citizenship here. You see uh, some domestic work is very servile, menial, physical labor, highly associated with race, the proximity to dirt, on the hands and floor to, to perform the idea of being servile. And then you see you know, white women taking on this other aspect of domestic work, the domestic work of supervising, 
of, or today, quality time, right, where that uh, worker's gender identity, even though it's unpaid work, is elevated through race um, and through the sense of moral superiority or entitlement and voice. And also in the background, too, you see European uh, uh, immigrants coming into, you know, the sort of domestic work um, and their positioning, which in over time, many of these European immigrants become white, are accepted as white, and take on different understandings of domestic work. This ad was an ad for soap in 1896, and the picture comes from the Smithsonian Archive. And just to let you know that uh, uh, racism and how it affects domestic work is still in the white supremacist imagination. So, you know, here is this very popular book and very popular movie, The Help. Um, and this work is uh, very problematic. It has all kinds of uh, issues with racism, which the Association of Black Women Historians have really put on the table and sort of shredded uh, any kind of intellectual merit in, in uh, this film, and some of whom are in this audience or you heard from last night, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that because I think they can do a much better job than I can. But I want to bring up an interesting point about the author, uh, Catherine Sprocket, who wrote this book when she started to write this book, which was the day after 9-11. She lived in Battery Park, so the story is. Um, and so she was really near ground zero. And after 9-11, she has this desire to return home. You know, and we are living in a period of time where home and return for domesticity for many reasons is really in the forefront of where we are. One major one, which many people don't realize but is with us, is that capitalism is going through a profound transformation in a person's lifetime, like my lifetime. So the majority of my lifetime has been spent imagining a capitalism where 5% of the world got 80% of the GDP. But by the end of my lifetime, that world's no longer going to, and we're already in the proce process of this transition, that world isn't going to exist, right? By the end of my lifetime, you're going to have something more like, and it's already happening, 5% of the developed world only has 35% of the GDP. And the rest of the world is, will have 65% of the GDP. It's a profound transformation. What does that mean for American workers is that many American workers are going to find themselves working in domestic work. Um, and then the other reason that I sort of like this uh, little image is the caption at the beginning, change begins with a whisper, which I don't like, but you know, whatever the it, merits are, or gossip or whatever, it has its merits. But uh, I want to just play a little play on that, which is I think change begins with the imagination. And here, I mean the imagination of imagined possibilities. You know, capitalism is in crisis, but crisis breeds its opportunities. So I think of the possibilities uh, in play that are happening now with the organizing of domestic workers um, in connection with the solidarity economy. Um, and the solidarity economy as, uh, I think in its more radical, there's kind of two ways to look at it as a sort of a human, a more human face of capitalism. But I'm more drawn to this other element of the solidarity economy, which is to create alternatives to capitalism, issues of like, let's say, the organizing of domestic workers that are happening in Massachusetts along the lines of social entrepreneurship and uh, cooperatives. Um, and also the possibilities, I think, uh, and it's not that hard to make these links, uh, and I'm surprised it hasn't been talked about yet, but it's to link up with the environmental movement, because the environmental movement uh, will, and has been, and will profoundly change the practice of domestic work, uh, whether it's in these small, minor ways, in the sense that we're going to be devoting more of our labor time to recycling or uh, getting more use out of our resources, the fact that we're spending more time um, uh, dedicated to taking care of what we eat and shopping because we're realizing that what you eat, uh, you are what you eat, and it's making us ill and sick and also the domestic work that's going to uh, have to be involved because many of us are ill and sick, and I'm not only talking about physical sickness, but mental sickness as well. And a lot of that work does take place in the home. Um, but, and also when I talk about the imagination, it's also not just these imagined possibilities, but it's very much related to, unfortunately, or you know, 
the difficulty, I think, of this work, which is the, our imaginal language and how language constrains us and divides us and helps us reproduce things even as we try to grapple with the same problem, you know, the servant problem uh, way back when, organizing domestic work today, to become very functional for capitalism. And I'll sort of just end it there. Thank you. Um, I want to thank very much uh, the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm slightly a fish out of water since my field is not either empirical work or um, as uh, an activist, though I've done quite a bit of activist work. Uh, but I come to the question of uh, justice for household laborers from a very personal experience, and that is that my daughter is uh, very disabled. Uh, my daughter is now 44 years old, and she lived at our home till she was 32. She is very severely disabled, both mentally and physically. And uh, in the time that Sesha has been with us, uh, we've employed a great deal of help. Um, I've worked as a professor of philosophy during all this time. My husband has also worked as a full-time academic. And um, in that time, I've come to really appreciate what was called here uh, the, hidden, the hidden skills of uh, good caregiving. I've come to appreciate that these exceed my own that there is real skill involved and more than skill, there's an incredible amount of talent. Um, everyone can draw, but not everyone can be a Picasso. Everyone can do some caregiving, but not everyone can do really excellent caregiving. And my daughter depends on that for her ability to just live, much less thrive. But at the same time, I've also become aware of the many snars and contradictions that my arrangement uh, of living this life has involved. And the arrangements not only of those who employ help, but those who don't employ help. Now, as Sasha has matured, and I've matured with her, I've become familiar with the developments in the larger disability community. And just at a time when I came to appreciate the inevitability of dependency and the importance of dependency care in all of our lives, um, but in, I see it writ large with someone who is fully dependent for all, all of her life, not just the first few years of infancy. So I've come to really study and look at dependency and think about dependency and its place in our lives. But at the same time, the disability community, uh, uh, sort of spearheaded by those with physical disabilities, have wanted to say that disability is not just the physical impairment. Disability, the disadvantages from disability, arise from social conditions, social conditions that are involved in the mismatch between the, the impaired body and the world that we live in. So that with a ramp, a person who is, has mobility impairments is not disabled in terms of being able to get where they want. Uh, with Without such, they are disabled. With uh, braille, with sign language, many people with sensory disabilities are not disabled. They can function in the world. And in particular, their interest has been on functioning independently. And functioning independently here has meant not having to be confined to segregated residential living in which every need is dictated by the uh, workers and the rules of the institution rather than by their own self-determination. So disabled people have insisted on 
personal attendance. And the term is important. They want to use the term personal attendance and not caregivers because caregiving for them has been a continuation of the infantilization that they've experienced throughout their lives and that they've had to deal with in the various settings in which they have lived. So what people with disabilities have said is that we want to join the rest of the citizens in being independent and productive in our lives. And to do this, we need various forms of assistance, including the assistance of a personal attendant. Well, the independent living movement has been uh, just incredibly important in improving the lives of a very disadvantaged community, and that is the disability community. However, the demands of this work involve deep contradictions because the, in order to feel that independence, it requires that the caregiver or the attendant be invisible. And the invisibility of the caregiver is something that the caregivers themselves understand as being an important feature of their own work. In an excellent article by uh, Lynn uh, May Rivas, and the, the whole article is very worthwhile looking at, uh, she quotes one immigrant care worker who described what he considered quality care. And he says, it's being able to put yourself in a situation where you are almost not seen where the recipient of care is so able to do what he wants, it almost feels like I'm doing this, and you're not even in the picture, in my mind. When he's so in tuned with what he's doing, what he wants to do, and really feels good, and you're almost non-existent, you're not there. It's like you're there, but you're not there. When you can do something without even realizing that they're doing it because you're there, that's quality work right there. And Linda, and Lynn Reed Mavis, uh, Mavis says now, how are we to understand this when the person who is the caregiver is him or herself? It's largely her, but it's also him. Um, uh, thinking about themselves as doing good quality work, work that they can take pride in uh, by making themselves invisible, by giving over, she says, their auth the authorship of their work to another. And she writes, are workers who articulate a desire to be invisible oppressed by being made so? Must one feel oppressed to be oppressed? I believe that it is the transfer of authorship. Uh, I believe that the, transfership, the transfer of authorship is a negative phenomenon, even for those who consciously work to make it happen. To be made invisible is the first step toward being non-human, which is why making another person invisible often precedes them, treating them inhumanely. To use Marx's terms, invisibility is the most extreme form of alienation, the ultimate manifestation of self-estrangement. So I think what we have here is something that looks very paradoxical. Uh, it is, in fact, I, I offer not all that different from the sorts of things we were talking about yesterday when we weren't talking about disability. Only in the case of the usual household worker, um, you sense that this is really unnecessary. And Judith Rollins here said, can we imagine a world without such domestic work? And we probably can imagine it, right? I mean, this is something that is not 
um, utopian in the sense of, uh, you know, we have to be completely different kinds of human beings to be that. But um, it's harder to imagine when you think about a disabled person, right, who is also oppressed, uh, is also marginalized, and who wants to join in as full, in, in, in their full citizenship, right, and needs this kind of work and to some extent this kind of invisibility. Is there any way to break this log jam? Well, there is, I think. A lot of it does have to do with the sorts of state uh, and uh, organization issues that we've been talking about. But some of it also has to do with a change in the way we view ourselves. And I started to talk about how living with Sasha made me understand and appreciate what philosopher Alistair McIntyre called the acknowledged vir the virtues of acknowledged dependency. That is to say, instead of seeing what the care workers are doing as making the other person independent and hence making herself invisible, to see what she's doing as managing, independ managing dependency in such a way that the person who is dependent can be treated with dignity and respect, and that she can be treated with dignity and respect. And I think it first takes acknowledging our dependency, <laughs> our inherent dependency as human beings, that we all have dependency needs of various sorts. And that this isn't something shameful. You know? Because when it is something shameful, of course you want the other person to be invisible. But if you can take it as part of life, it needn't be. And there are advantages not only to the person who is the care worker, right, who can not have this kind of self-alienation, but also to the person who's being cared for, because they can live a life without a lie, without the lie of a fictional independence, right? can live a more authentic self. And so I think when we're thinking about organizing and coalitions, it's really important to try to pull in this community, which sometimes is very open to it and sometimes is not, sometimes resistant to it. And I think it's important to try to break that resistance right, and to have that dependency and that interdependency be recognized as part of a valuable and dignified way of living. So I think that's uh, all I'll say in these quick introductory remarks. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you know, I am not Peggy Smith, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, Peggy Smith is one of the really leading experts uh, around domestic work and legal inequality. Uh, I'm going to do my best to speak about this issue a little bit, although it's a big void to fill. Um, the title of this panel is The Inequalities of Race, Class, Gender, and Citizenship. Um, and I'm going to focus my comments on the legal inequality and exclusions uh, as a marker of citizenship uh, and focus in particular on what this means for workers. Um, there's been a very long history of the marginalization of household labor and some of this has to do uh, with the association of household labor with women's unpaid labor in the home, uh, which historically has not been considered real work because it's work that women did out of love and out of care for their own families. The marginalization of the work also results uh, in the character of the workforce, in the paid workforce. So if you look at the history of paid domestic labor in this country, it's been an occupation filled largely by immigrant women 
uh, including European women, as well as women of color in this country, Mexican American women, um, African American women, Native American women. Uh, the marginalization of the labor uh, is also connected to the isolated nature of the work, its location in the home. Uh, and the home is often not considered a site of work, a site of labor, it's considered a site of leisure. So all of these, I, I think, in, you know, for a very long period of time, has reinforced uh, household labor as marginal work uh, that's not recognized in the same way as other forms of work. Uh, but I think it's, there's also the bigger issue of the legal exclusions of household labor. And some of my comments will resonate a little bit with what Jen said in terms of the role of the state uh, in helping to create greater inequality among the workforce. And I want to highlight the period of the 1930s and the New Deal in particular. And the New Deal was significant because this was a moment when the vast majority of workers in this country were granted labor rights. So when we look at things like Social Security and the fact that people are guaranteed Social Security today, that was passed in 1935 as part of the Social Security Act. The Fair Labor Standards Act, which gave workers the right to minimum wages and overtime pay, was passed in the 1930s as part of the New Deal. The National Labor Relations Act, which gave workers the right to organize and bargain collectively, was also passed in the 1930s. Um, so I think, you know, if we look at the New Deal as a whole, it represented enormous progress for the working class in this country. This was the first time that the federal government stepped in to aid and assist the working people of this country. Prior to that, it had a very checkered history, and that history was much more likely to be one of breaking strikes uh, on behalf of employers than advocating on behalf of workers. So despite the ways uh, I think that the uh, New Deal was an important uh, marker of progress for working people in this country, there were also very important exclusions as a part of the New Deal. Domestic workers and agricultural workers were two of the most important occupations uh, that were excluded from the provisions of New Deal labor laws. And this was more than just an oversight. It was not an accident. Okay? Uh, there was a deliberate exclusion, especially of these two categories of workers, uh, because of the racial politics of the time. Okay? Both, domestic worker, both domestic work and agricultural work were largely African American occupations. And it was that history of racism, that history of slavery, that led to the exclusions of these workers. Uh, and there, there's a, quite a bit of literature that talks about the ways in which Southern Democrats and Congress in particular were obstacles to the extension of labor rights to domestic workers and agricultural workers. Uh, but I would like to say that it wasn't only Southern Democrats, but it was also Northern liberals who were really vested with a notion of white racial privilege and a particular notion of who the worker was. And the worker in their mind was a white male industrial worker. So Northern liberals, Democrats in the North were also very much a part of constructing what the legislation, and women, I should add, women reformers were also very much a part of that history and that strategy of constructing who would be included and excluded from labor law. Uh, these exclusions were not only important because uh, these categories of workers were denied rights, of course that was important, but I think it's also significant to recognize the ways in which the law created or recreated or reinforced the inequalities that already existed. Okay. So the legal system in the 1930s actually institutionalized these inequalities. So the law furthered the divisions within the working class between those who were protected and those who were not protected. And I think this is part and parcel of why we see uh, the vast majority of workers with rights today, right, and certain sectors of worker without rights. Uh, the exclusions around labor law have been a central pivot uh, around which household workers have organized since the 1930s. Um, so in 1950, they won the right to Social Security. In 1974, in part because of a very long 
struggle. They won the right to minimum wage. Um, and the current Bill of Rights campaigns that have been passed in four states and are pending in several others um, are also an important uh, strategy in terms of trying to advocate for the legal rights of household workers. You know, and I will just say that one uh, important obstacle that still exists is the ways in which domestic workers are still not guaranteed the right to organize and bargain collectively. And I think that's an important issue that's, that's still on the agenda of uh, the domestic worker rights movement today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, thanks to our speakers for that. And uh, I'm going to start just with a couple questions, and then we're going to open it up to the to all of you. And as I was listening to these presentations and to the speakers' very carefully measured words, I was reminded about the importance of language in all of what we're talking about it, and the way in which certain narratives have worked to mask the inequalities of race, class, gender, and citizenship as it pertains to domestic workers. And you know what those narratives are, right? you're one of the family, or the narratives around immigration and immigration status, you know, what, what rights, what workers' rights should an individual have? And then there's the language around skills, is this skilled work and so on. We can make go right down the list. Um, and so many of these narratives, as I said, work to mask the inequalities that we're concerned about. But if you're trying to shift public policy, if you're trying to make a public policy change, you've got to command the, the language. You've got to shape the way in which the general public thinks about a problem. It's one of the reasons why I think NDWA's tagline, which I believe is one of the most effective in the entire workers' rights world, um, the tagline, the work that makes all other work possible, as a counter narrative, I think is incredibly powerful. But what I want to ask the, the participants is, is to help me flesh this out a little bit, talk a little bit about the role of language in policy, in the household, in the way in which the general public thinks about domestic work. They've not been warned about any of these questions, I, I'll let you know. But anyway, see if, if anyone has anything they'd like to say about this. Well, I think um, one of the things that happens is that, um, in, in terms of this language, is the way in which um, uh, the needs of people who need to be cared for are um, put forward as, as a priority and the needs of workers, as you were saying, are kind of pitted against them. Um, and so um, uh, there's this downward pressure on, on the wages because the people who advocate um, say, well, uh, you know, it's in the public interest to, um, to make sure that care is as widely accessible and that somehow higher wages and better compensation would then would contradict that. And, and so whether it's policymakers or justices, Justice Breyer invoked this phrasing in the Evelyn Koch Supreme Court case in 2007, saying, well, millions of people would not be able to afford home care, basically, if they had to abide by the nation's wage and hour law. Um, and so we were acting in the public interest um, by excluding such workers from the labor standards regime. But then what that does is it essentially grants this additional moral license to appropriate their labor on the cheap because it implies that denial and self-sacrifice are essential to this ethic of care. And then what it does, of course, is it masks um, the relations of class exploitation that you were talking about. So I think that's that's one way um, in which we see uh, the language working, and then also, uh, you know, about it, dependence, interdependence, and independence. Yeah, because I just wanted to pick up on this question of dependence. Uh, I got particularly interested in the <coughs> in the uh, welfare reform movement in the 1990s. Uh, in the way in which the term dependence was deployed. And uh, the, uh, the folks who were receiving welfare were pictured as dependent. Now, if you look at who was getting 
uh, these the, the benefits of AFDC, such as they are, uh, it's mostly women with children. That is to say, it's women who are taking care of dependents. Okay? Uh, dependent children is right in there. What happens when you're taking care of a dependent? You too become dependent. Okay? You become dependent on someone else to be able to provide resources to you and your dependent person. Okay? The dependencies that we live with are nested. One is nested in another. So the uh, woman who is married to the provider, well, his, he's dependent too. He's dependent if he's got a job on his boss or if he's self-employed on his customers. Um, we are all in these nested dependencies. Dependency has gotten a really bad rap. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the words we have to change the valence of is dependence. Okay? Uh, de we're dependent on air. We don't, we don't go around talking about how terrible it is that we have to breathe because we're dependent on air. Uh, we have to change this idea that being dependent is necessarily bad. There are bad things about it. I'd rather do some things myself than to wait for someone else to do them. But that means managing that dependency. It doesn't mean eliminating it or pretending it doesn't exist. And with that broad stroke of dependence, which re-entered into our language with the Romney campaign in a big way, we have to take hatchets and just bash it down, you know, bash down, change that the valence of that term, and make that term into an off, not an honorific, but just just defang it. Dependency is uh, marginalized or seen as a negative, right? It, because it's a feminine term. It's associated with feminine qualities, and we live in a narrative, a general narrative, right, that flows from capitalism that's androcentric, that's based on the individual, not independent relationships. The individual who, you know, uh, commands nature, controls nature, um, is never seen as dependent, is the, the productive, capable individual who masters the environment, yeah? Um, so I would also add that another word that we'd have to look at is uh, a word that might sound strange to you, but I'll break it down, which is this idea that our imagination is framed by capital centricism. So that's why I like the tagline, capital centricism, yeah. okay. capitalism. the center, centering of capitalism as the only economic practice that we do. That's why I love the tagline, right? Uh, domestic workers uh, produce the uh, people that make all work possible, right? Because that's the center of the economy. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, we are socialized to, in this particular point in time, you know, to become clogs in the development of, uh, let it rip capitalism and to think of how we can be more productive and never be dependent and, and all these problems that are there. But the real underlying thing we should be thinking about, I mean, it's bizarre, right? I mean, we exist for an economic system or is the economic system existing to benefit humanity? I mean, it's that simple. And if it's not existing to benefit humanity, then it needs to be put on the table and it needs to be, you know, questioned. I would add about the language question is, is, is this on? No. Is um, the question of, of naming, so what you call a household worker uh, and how you, I mean the occupation and the individual. Uh, and so it's very common practice uh, if you have a household worker to call them by their first name, for example, yet they are often expected to refer to their employers as Mr. or Mrs. Um, so I think that's one important issue uh, and in the 1970s, uh, the Household Technicians of America was formed, and as you can tell from the title of that name, they did not want to be called maids, they did not want to be called servants, they wanted to be called household technicians. And I think what, what this signifies both 
that title as well as the ways in which we call individuals by their first name or with a Mr. or Ms. in front of it is how we think of the work, the character of the work. Is this unskilled labor or is this professional labor? And I think household workers today and in the 1970s insisted that the work they did was certainly important, but it was also professional work mm -hmm. that, need, that needed to be respected in that way. Mm -hmm. The other thing um, on, on this idea of interdependence, and I think this comes back to Pramila's talk about liberal citizenship is the model of liberal citizenship is based so much on the singular person and this notion that the singular person is going to be independent. And so we just have this myth that somehow a person is going to be moved along to this final state of independence and then it will have been achieved when in fact, as you say, that's, that's, that's just not you know, how anybody's lives run. And so I think it's also that we have to get away from what's embedded in, in liberal citizenship. And then on the question of capitalism, um, which I agree with you and I think also was um, really nice the way you talked about um, uh, the imaginary as well. Um, and, um, and Eileen mentioned last night, you know, we need to start changing our understandings of capitalism, its history, its mechanisms of exploitation and, and heighten this. And, you know, if we think about the kind of work that we're talking about, obviously it consists of more than tasks completed. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't produce something that can be easily quantitatively measured or represented in GNP, even though, as you say, it's essential to the economy now. Um, and so much of the struggle that I think you all and we are involved in and the workers are involved in is establishing the legitimacy of what is produced. It's human care, it's kindness, and yet this defies our very definitions of work as production, you know, which is what, you know, is essential to a capitalist economy. And so, you know, we really have to change our very fundamental understandings um, that can actually take into account the intimacy of work and, and what it is that we want to produce out of of these labors. I, one of the things I want to talk about is, is care and the, the question of sacrifice. Um, in the work of Carol Gilligan, she talks about care as being always relational. And that if you have a relation, you have to have two individuals. And when you have one individual subsumed by the other one, taken over by the other, you no longer have a relation. And this is what's so dangerous in caring relations, is allowing one, one person to subsume the other. Rivas talks about the interviews that she did of uh, care attendants and the consumers of the care, uh, which is a bizarre word, but uh, that the caregivers always talk exactly as you do, that we give so much love. It isn't just a job. And I've seen it with my eyes, I see it all the time not only toward my daughter, but toward others as well. The person who wants that care to be independent, when asked, what does this caregiver do above and beyond her care work? And they think, nothing really. It's all in the job description. Well, care is a very, if I was thinking about care like acting, you know? An actor goes to work. An actor expects to get paid, right? That's the compensation. But an actor needs more than compensation, though they need compensation. <laughs> they need the applause. They need the showing that this, that they understand what that person has given. Right? And when that doesn't happen, that relationship 
is not really a relationship. And there's something terrible, fa terribly false and exploitative and sacrificial about that. Care shouldn't be sacrificial. That's, um, and, and as far as caregiver, the term caregiver, I've, I've struggled with this a lot. I mean, there are caregivers who are disabled, right? We, we make this dichotomy. I think rather than giving up the term caregiver, I would want to expend what it means, right? That the care, that if we care about care, we care about the caregiver as well. Also, I, I mean, this comes back to naming and actually do people have the prerogative to name what they do and, you know, choose how mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be referred to. But, you know, in addition to this change in, on an ideological level or a philosophical level, there's got to be the enforcement of law. Exactly. You know, yes. we have labor laws and, you know, we need to put the pressure on the state to enforce these laws, to expand their coverage, and the state needs to recognize people um, as workers. So I think that that's one thing that's you know key, and to also not let um, you know either the policymakers, the welfare administrators, the home care agencies try to set this up as a zero sum equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the one thing I'd, I'd like to ask you to elaborate on, if I can, is in terms of, of that interaction is the question of power and, and fears about who has power over whom. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the disability rights movement in, you know, really pursuing the notion of autonomy and self-determination, you know, wants both individual power and social power. And so, as you say, you know, it can come at the cost of the worker um, and so, you know, then we're looking at how can the workers build up sufficient power to get themselves recognized as doing legitimate work and um, being able to act collectively. Um, and yet then, you know, people fear, oh, what if the worker has too much power? Right. What if the worker doesn't show up? What if they go on strike? And so, you know, how do we deal with, you know, these anxieties of power and yet, you know, the need to exercise it collectively. Uh, well, I'll just address that last point about the silos among workers. And I think that's a really important point, and not just among people who do care work or what we would call domestic work, but even other categories of workers who've been excluded historically from labor law, like restaurant workers, mm -hmm. like guest mm -hmm. workers, things like that. And there's and, and, and part of the organizing that's happened over the past several years has been uh, the development of what's called the Excluded Workers Congress, which is now called the United Workers Congress, which has tried to bring together workers in different sectors who are experiencing the similar kinds of legal exclusions. And, you know, I think this is especially significant because I think this is the future of America. That model that we had of the factory worker who works at the same job, his, and I'm using his deliberately, his entire life and gets a pension from his employer is no longer the norm for workers in this country. So I, so I think the organizing of domestic workers is really pointing the way forward to the future of what our economy is going to look like. Cecilia? I would just support that. Yeah, totally. Right. <laughs> Me too. Um, any of the comments that have been said, yeah. I, and I, I mean, to add to that, one thing that's going on in New Haven, where I live right now, um, you know, because also so many people are underemployed and not regularly employed and precariously employed, is to figure out how you actually build the organizing movement through the, through the community um, and build it neighborhood by neighborhood. And therefore, it's based on different kinds of attachments. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the person and the boss. Um, that actually, as you build through neighborhoods and build through communities, and you focus on what is it that the community actually needs to be sustainable, then it combines you know, the economic questions, the social questions, and even um, the environmental questions. So that's, that's one way in which I think we're going to have to Move forward, and and that way also build you know the community wealth in many senses. Um, 
as usual, as a philosopher, I'm <laughs> abstracting. Um, so I speak about dependency work and dependency workers. That includes paid and unpaid dependency work. I think as long as we're not also focusing on the unpaid dependency work, we're never going to get dependency work paid properly. Um, so I think we need uh, more organizing that's also about paying people who do work for dependents and in relations of dependents. Uh, and, uh, and uh, well, my, my utopian vision is that all dependency work would be paid well, right? whether it's familial or unfamiliar. <laughs> that's my, my uh, utopian vision. One last thing about power, and I also make a distinction between power and domination. And uh, each member of a dependency relationship may have power over the other person. Right? The nurse will have, the, the caregiver will have depend power over a person who is totally dependent or who's very dependent, but that doesn't mean that that person dominates her. The, a uh, person who is uh, being cared for may have power over the other uh, in terms of being of a higher class, uh, socioeconomically, but that doesn't mean that she has any uh, right to dominate the uh, worker. So I think when we think about power, we should think about domination as, uh, as well, because not all power is bad. All domination is bad. <laughs> well said. Well, I'd like to uh, to thank our, our four panelists for for deep and actually powerful presentations, and thanks you for uh, for your attention. This conversation will continue. You've earned a break. Go take it. Don't forget to come back. Thank you. <laughs>